We are in a summer to remember. We're looking at easy to remember verses of scripture that speak to us when we're afraid, ashamed, worry, or weary. Um, we've begun by looking at verses that speak to us when we're afraid. A couple of verses that, that fit together nicely. It says, be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. When we're in times where we're threatened, there's a couple natural responses to fear. Fight, flight, freeze, or faith. And these are some verses that we can put our faith in when we are threatened. God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. When we're afraid, God wants us to be still to cease striving, and to let our hands hang limp at our side. That's what be still literally means. It means to let go and cease striving to the physical, the gesture that it calls for is to let our hands, our arms hang limp at our side. God wants us to know that he will never leave or forsake us. Is there anything else, though, that God wants us to do when we are afraid? And there is, and that leads us to the verse for today. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Look at that verse, very short. Something that easy to remember, that we can put into our minds. Review that a few times in your mind. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Could you memorize that? See, if we have something like that memorized, we can think about it. Reminds us of promises that God makes to us when we're threatened. Something that as we make room for it in our mind, it gives us something to focus on when we're afraid and when we're threatened. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. God wants us to trust him and to pour out our hearts to him. The fruit of trust is pouring out our hearts to God. Let's look at this psalm by King David to learn about talking to God. It says, and this song begins, and it's a psalm of David. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. David starts to think about, by thinking about the fact that God is a source of rest, David understands that, that God is a source of rest. And it seems that if we put our finger on the pulse of the Bible, understanding that God is a source of rest seems to be one of those foundational things that a lot of other things are supported by. Um, we have seen this verse. It says in Scripture, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. And it's talking about the example of disobedience that the Israelites set in the wilderness. And they were exposed to a lot of threatening circumstances, things that were very difficult to deal with, and they never seemed to be able to find an ability to respond in a way that, that pleased and honored God. They, they seemed to fall back into grumbling and fault-finding. They, they fell into resentment and blaming. These kind of responses in times of fear, we don't need to learn to fault-find. We don't need to learn to blame. These things are natural, to grumble. Um, it suggests, then, if we think about how in the world do you overcome resentment? 
when something happens, something that is going to make things difficult for us, and if somebody's fault, our fault, or somebody else's fault, it's very difficult not to feel resentful. And how do we get around that in the wilderness? Their resentment was as fresh the 39th year as it was in the first. Resentment is something that has no half-life. It just gets stronger and stronger as the years go by. We think of what they did, what I experienced, and how do we get around resentment when things threaten us? It suggests that the way to address fault-finding and resentment and blame has to do with making every effort to enter God's rest. That's what it says, make every effort to enter God's rest so that we don't fall by following their example of disobedience. We've said this before, but it seems to hold up relative to spiritual development. Entering God's rest is priority one. Think about your life, think about our life, and we experience things that threaten us. What in the world are we supposed to do? There's things that are concerning. Things that, that when we wake up in the middle of the night, we think about it, and we don't want to think about it. But we wake up, and there it is. Or we wake up in the morning, and there's the circumstance, the relationship, the financial thing. We don't ask for these thoughts to come up. They just come up, and we have to deal with them. And, and we try to listen to the radio, or we try to turn our way and they just don't go. What do we do with stuff like that? And what the Bible would indicate? Find rest. Make every effort to enter God's rest. David doesn't just think about finding rest. Look where this, this psalm goes. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Let's notice something that he begins by saying, my soul finds rest in God alone. But David doesn't just think about what God is like. He starts there, but that's not where he ends. Look what he does. He says, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. Do you know what David is doing here? He's not just listening to himself. He's talking to himself. He's not just listening to himself. He's talking to himself. We talk to ourselves all the time when we listen to ourselves in the middle of the night when we get up early in the morning. What if that happens? Oh, no. What if? Oh, no. What if? And these kind of dialogues go on in our brain. We learn to listen to ourselves. But learning to talk to ourselves. That seems to be a different thing. I'd suggest we have a well-developed ability to listen to ourselves, concerns that we find. And we have a less developed ability to talk to ourselves. David talks to himself. He says, find rest, O my soul. In God alone, he looks down and his soul is agitated. And he doesn't just recognize the agitation. He speaks to it. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. If we have promises, we can think about them and remind ourselves of them. We will, this is what David does. Um, after talking to himself, David encourages us to talk to God. He says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him. 
for God is our refuge. God wants us to pour out our hearts to him when we're threatened. When we encounter something threatening, fear is the natural response. Fear is a natural response to a perceived threat. Fear is not something we can prevent. We are going to become afraid. And when we are afraid, what God wants us to do, what David is telling us to do, here's the verse. Trust in him at all times. What does it mean to trust in God? It means we pour out our hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Um, God wants us to pour out our hearts to him when we're threatened. Some feel that calling out to God in times that are difficult is distrust. If we trusted God, we wouldn't worry to begin with. Or we wouldn't bug God with a lot of things that we're dealing with. If we trusted God, some of us, are we, we come to places where we think, well, if I trusted God, I wouldn't talk to him about it. I just wouldn't mind. It just wouldn't bother me. It's not what it's saying. It's going to bother us. And what God says, what he wants, what expression of trust is, is not that we don't pour out our hearts, but that we do. That indicates trust. That's what David seems to be suggesting. It's a sign of trust. It's something that God commands us to do. We've seen this verse before. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's addressing us in a time of need, a frightening time, a threatened time. It says we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That word help comes from a word that actually means rope, and it has this sense to it. When ships were encountering stormy seas, what they would do at that time is they would frap the boat. They would take a heavy rope and they would bind the boat. They'd wrap this rope around the boat so that the, the waves and the wind would not tear the boat asunder. That's the sense for help. It's when we are in difficult times, God wants to provide us with support. And what he says to us that he wants us to approach the throne of grace with confidence. If we do, we'll receive mercy and find grace to help, for, to frap us, to bind us, to help us hold it together. When it says approach the throne of grace with confidence, that word is a very particular word. It has to do with coming into the chambers of someone in authority believing that we have the ability to enter those chambers. And what God, what it's describing in the context is God wants us to come to him when we are being threatened. He invites us, no, he commands us to come into his presence with confidence. That doesn't just mean to enter. What confidence means is to speak freely when we're there. That's the word. Enter into God's presence and speak freely with him when you are there. Talk to him. Pour out your heart to him. That's what God commands us to do. And if we do that, it says we will find we we'll receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's something God wants us to do. We're encouraged to come to God's throne in the context of this verse because of Jesus' sympathy. Because he sympathizes with our weaknesses. What prevents us from coming to God when we're threatened? Think about people that you call when you're threatened and afraid. Who is a person that you call? 
Have a person of mine? What about that person encourages you to call them? I would imagine a couple things. It's a person that doesn't judge you. You shouldn't be worried. Oh, stop that. We don't really call somebody who's going to dismiss our fear. It's also not a person who will crumple. You know, if we talk to somebody and, and tell them what we're dealing with, oh my goodness, you're dealing, you know, easy. You know, we, 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 it's not just about somebody, well, we need a couple of things, don't we? We need somebody with a big heart who cares enough. But we also need somebody with big enough shoulders that won't get crushed. Would you agree? That's the kind of thing. Look what David ends up saying when he talks about what he experiences. He says, one thing God has spoken. Two things have I heard. That you, O God, are strong. And that you, O God, are loving. David tried to tune God in so that he could pour out his heart when he was threatened. God gave him a couple of things to think about so that David would find the ability to pour out his heart to him. And God said two things to him. I think he says them to us as well. I think he'd say them to you. And what he would say is this. I am strong. And I am loving. You are not going to bore me by coming. I'm loving. But I'm strong, so I'm not going to get crushed. One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard, that you, O oh God, are strong, and that you, O oh God, are loving. If God is strong, but not loving, if God is strong, but not loving, we can't pour out our hearts to him. It's too scary. He's too big. If he's loving, but not strong, we can't pour out our hearts to him because it might crush him. If God is strong and loving, well, that encourages us to approach his presence. The word loving here. It's not really emotional. The word love, it comes from a Hebrew word that literally is point, it's really about covenant faithfulness. That's what the word loving means. It's a Hebrew word, chesed. And it means covenant faithfulness. And here's what loving chesed means. This is when somebody enters into a contract with you and when the occasion comes, they will follow through with what they said they would do. So here's the way it worked. In Bible times, when you formed a contract with someone, let's say you were part of an inferior, kind of vulnerable nation. You had a lot of enemies around. You didn't have a really good army and you felt threatened by the armies that existed around you. Let's say that you were trying to find a way to be able to be more secure. So what you do, we reach out to a very powerful king, and you would enter into a covenant with this king. And a covenant has commitments, commandments, and consequences. So this king, let's say, you are the vulnerable people, and I am a powerful king. And you come to me and you say, King Mike, um, we're threatened by all these kind of things. We want to come into a covenant with you. And I'd say, okay, let's talk then. Here's what I'm going to promise you. I'm going to promise you that if you are attacked, I will come and defend you. That's my commitment to you. My commitment to you. Now, there will be commandments. So there will be things that you'll have to do in the context of the way covenants usually work. You'd have to do something for me. You might give me, 
10,000 talents of gold or this, that, or the other, but you would have things that you need to do. There's commitments, here's what I'm going to do, commandments, what you have to do, and consequences. The deal with, here's the funny thing about a covenant like this. If you are threatened and don't tell me, I'm going to have a real problem with that. Because this is an agreement we made that in a time of threat, you would call to me. Now, if you don't call out to me, you know the way I'm going to see that? I wonder if you're turning to another king. Why aren't you pouring out your heart to me? See, when we think of love, love, when it comes to God, when it says God is loving, we can think about that as emotional. It's not really emotional. Now, does God have feelings? Yeah, but that's not what this word is saying. When it says that God is loving, what God says, I will always keep a covenant promise. And when you then call out and it, God responds, that's loving. It's covenant faithfulness. That's what the word indicates. Um, God wants us to speak freely with him about our concerns. Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Um, it's a couple things we think about. What do we do when we're threatened? How do we approach God? What should we do? This might be an outline. Number one, be real. Approaching God, be real. We have a tendency sometimes to think that God wants us to say things that, that we imagine that he would like us to say. You know what God wants from us? He wants us to be honest. He already knows our fear. He wants us to admit it to him. Sometimes we think about, well, I just need to be able to tell God things that he wants me to hear. God, thank you for today, and thank God for the day. You know, thank God for the weather, and thank God for stuff like that. But if you're, if you're encountering something scary, what God says, I want you to pour out your heart to me. And be real. Be honest about it. God, I'm frightened. I don't, I don't know where the money's going to come from. God, I am concerned. I feel this way. God, I'm, I don't... So be real. Be real. Then be still. That's what it says. The problem, it's a promise we looked at last time. You remember it? Do you remember it? Be still and know that I am God. I will never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. Be real. Stop. Before you call, before you get the calculator, before you read the book, before you call the friend, maybe even, stop. Be still. Let your arms hang limp at your side. Let go. And think about God's commitments. What are his commitments? You memorized a few. Never will I leave you. I will never cast you adrift. That's what it means. God will never untie you so that you are driven by the waters into terrible things. God says, I will never leave you. I will never cast you adrift. I will never leave you behind. If you get in a circumstance where you're isolated, God says, I will never leave you alone. That's what he says in that context. And you know what it means to be still then? It's to stop and to think about what God says to you and to make room for it. Be still. Then speak freely. Pour out. Oh God, you know what? I need this. I need that. So be real. Be still. Speak freely. Those are the action words. And what's going to happen as a result, it will provide the ability to wait perseveringly and respond gently. Waiting perseveringly, responding gently, that will come naturally. It's not natural, but as we learn to not only think about God, but to tell ourselves about him. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. It's something that we remind ourselves of. And in fact, point 
two and three, the I think those are really pivotal. And I, this, here's a way that we might think about them. Uh, be still by inhaling his commitments. He said, you will never leave me, you never forsake me. Think about them, inhale them. Inhale his commitments, exhale your concerns, inhale, exhale. We can look at this as spiritual breathing. Inhale his commitments, exhale your concerns. Inhale his commitments. I want you to think of a frightening thing that you're facing. God says, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Breathe that in. Breathe it in. But there's things that you're going to need. God, give me strength. Give me peace. Give me finances. <sighs> Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Inhale his commitments. Exhale your concerns. And as a result, it leads to waiting perseveringly and responding gently. The ability to do this doesn't come quickly. In fact, in David's life, he experienced a lot of very difficult things, and he learned to pour his heart out to God. My sense is that anybody who has learned to pour out his heart to God has had to experience difficult things in order to learn it, and it's taken a long time. That seems to be the way it is. It doesn't come... If you find yourself... Well, let me suggest this. You're saying, if you would say, Mike, you know what? I really would like to do this. I'd like to learn to... What was it, Mike, again? Inhale his commitments, exhale your concerns. My one piece of advice, that's how you find rest, and I'd say that's a great thing. You can't wait until a crisis to practice it, though. If you wait until a crisis to practice it, other coping mechanisms will overwhelm. So you know what you got to do? Try to make a habit of it. First thing in the morning, when do you think about God? When you go to bed? When you wake up? When you wake up in the middle of the night? Can I encourage you? Think about these things. God says, be still. Know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Pour out, to hearts, pour out your hearts to him. Trust in God at all times. Pour out your hearts for he is our refuge. Learning to talk to God in non-crisis times, you know what will happen when you get in a crisis time? It will be a little bit easier for you to bring these things into your thoughts and into your actions. Um, there's a couple of reactions that we do naturally when we are afraid. Fight, flight, freeze, and faith. Faith is a supernatural response. The first three are natural responses. And we've looked at a couple of verses that help us to place our faith in him. Could you remember these verses? They're verses that could help when you're afraid. Be still. Know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your hearts. For God is our refuge. I'm going to do this from week to week. I'm just giving you a chance. I'm going to be quiet. We're just going to give about a minute. Think about these verses. Mold them over in your mind. And then I'll close in prayer. It strikes me. The first verse is an inhale verse, isn't it? And the second verse is an exhale verse. Be still and know that I'm God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Inhale. That's a commitment verse. Trust in Him at all times, people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is a refuge. That's an exhale verse.
Let's stand for closing prayer. God, thanks for your promises. And it's natural for us to listen to ourselves. It's not natural for us to talk to ourselves and to remind us of things that you tell us. Uh, David experienced that, and that became the foundation of him being able to call out to you in difficult times. That's what you want us to do, to approach the throne of grace with confidence. You want us to pour out our hearts, and that's not something that comes naturally. Um, I ask that as we make room in our minds for promises, that that becomes foundational. We'll think about the fact that you are strong and you're loving, and little by little, we'll learn to more naturally, over a period of time, going through difficulties to pour out our hearts to you. Thanks that you tell us that that's what you want us to do, and and thanks for David, who encourages us to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.